Wow, the energy in the room is amazing. It's wonderful to be here. Wow, what an honor to be here with all of you for a couple of days. This is really wonderful, really remarkable. Um, it's such a joy to be in this ministry and to be called of God and to be used in these ways. I love the worship. I was touched by the Lord as we were singing some of these songs and reflecting on the power and the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to have an amazing few days here together, and I look forward to connecting with some of you who I've known and some of you who I've um, uh, hoped to get to know. And, and I want to uh, start this uh, time with appreciating the Christian Union staff and faculty. We've got some amazing, amazing people who work hard. They love the students. They, they expend themselves. They stay up late. They receive your texts at 2 in the morning. They uh, provide meals for you. They teach you uh, the word. They hold out the word of life. They pray for you and minister to you. And I'm so grateful for them. If you're on staff with Christian Union or faculty, would you mind standing up for a moment? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And also, so many students here, most of you, many of you have leadership roles in the ministries on campus. You also stay up late. You pray like crazy. You share the gospel. You hold out the word of life, and you minister as well. For all students here who have a role responsibility on campus, would you mind standing up so we can appreciate you? Thank you. Thank you. It's your labor, your labor of love that the Lord uses so much. He tells us in the scriptures to pray uh, that laborers would be raised up, that the Lord of harvest, the harvest would raise up laborers. And so all of you are an answer to the prayers of so many. Thank you. Our, our vision as an organization is to see the nation become much more spiritually vibrant. Uh, we have a passion to see the nation change and the values of our Savior, Jesus Christ, to go all across the country and from there to go all across the world. And our, our main means of doing that is to go to places where there's a, a large number of leaders and future leaders and to develop them as Christian leaders. So that's why we pick the universities that we do. That's why we're ministering in New York City and in the future in other cities because leadership matters, and we want to see the nation change through leaders, through the Lord raising up laborers. That's who we are. That's why the Lord called us to, um, to minister. And I want to start this evening with asking yourself a question. It's not a trick question, but the question is, do you want to be significant? Do you want to be significant? It's a genuine question. Uh, I think... Uh, a lot of people, when they think about that, for so many, what pops to mind is significance comes from the messages you hear in the media, the messages you hear in your college newspaper, other places. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time you open up the, either online or in person, one of the student newspapers, it's an alumnus, and oh, they're making millions of dollars now, and they graduated two years ago. Oh, they got a gold medal. Oh, um, they're with this great firm. They, they're making this great discovery and doing all these things. And the message gets reinforced again and again that this is what significance is. And there's nothing wrong with, with having significance. You see, even in the scriptures, you see James and John's mother going to Jesus and wanting to get him a special place for them. Uh, Jesus let her know that it didn't work the way she thought. She, he didn't rebuke her for wanting their, her kids to be able to be standouts in some ways, but their understanding of what that looked like is different uh, than the way it really is. That's what we want to look at this evening. What is significance? What is true significance? It cuts across all these other different ways of looking at life. It's truly spiritual and truly remarkable. We're going to look at what significance is, what it accomplishes, and then how to attain it. So again, I want to emphasize of what significance is not. It's not the media messages we get constantly. It's so tempting to have these things rolling over your mind. You're going to be the superstar athletic player. You're going to be the person who discovers this or X, Y, and Z in your science lab. You're going to make millions of dollars and do this over here. Or you're going to be famous or whatever else. Those messages just come uh, again and again. 
And I want to tell you that ministry people are not immune to this. I've, uh, most ministry people are amazing, wonderful folks, but I have noticed through the years there are ministry people who get sidetracked, and what it becomes for them is uh, how, how many people are in my following, how big is my ministry, how much money is coming in, how well-known and influential am I. This can come and dominate a person's mind. It is not of the Lord. It's not what the Lord wants. Um, it's also not about avoiding prominent positions. I don't know if you've ever had this temptation in your own heart. I've seen it worked out in Christians. They felt like, well, I don't want to do the worldly view of significance, so I'll do just the opposite. I won't go to any college that's kind of a more famous brand name college. I'm not going to go and take certain jobs that pay a certain or a lot of money or they're famous. I'm not going to do these things. I'm just going to kind of check out with everything in the world. And so it's a, it's a reaction against a worldly view. But it's not the spiritual view. It's not the true view. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I've seen people do it wanting to be used of God, wanting to have true significance, but not understanding what it is. So what is it? What is true significance? Significance is loving, following, and serving our creator. No matter what the cost, no matter where he takes you, no matter what he does in your life and calls you to do, to maintain fellowship with him. He's got a destiny and person and purpose for every person in this room. Everyone in this room has been called and the Lord has an intention for you. Even if you don't know the Lord yet, you're not a Christian. He has a purpose in heaven for you that is to be lived out now. Will you step into it? Will you discover it? Will you step into it in faith and fulfill it? That's the question we have. It's very different uh, when we follow the Lord versus going our own way and going our own view of significance. We, we learn to love and to uh, return love for hatred. We realize it means making sacrifices, even when it's very hard and difficult and nobody will ever know. It will never be on our resume. Um, it means giving up things and things that people around you are astonished that you would set aside and give up. There's a lot of examples in the scriptures. You have examples of people like Daniel, who was significant, Abigail, Esther, John, uh, James in the New Testament, Paul, Elijah, so many people doing so many different things. I think of even uh, more modern day examples. Certainly Billy Graham, what an extraordinary man uh, here. Yeah, amen. Praise God for him. He's receiving his reward, a man of extraordinary significance, having shared the gospel I think with a few hundred million people. I've met people through the years who came to faith through him and his ministry. How wonderful that he followed the Lord's call. So much of this country and the world has been blessed by him. But it's not just those who go into vocational ministry. Actually, the majority of Christians who live lives of significance are not in the ministry sphere. It's all over. And it's amazing the opportunities we have in every sphere in which the Lord calls us to do something extraordinary, to obey the Lord and do what he asks. I, I remember um, some time ago, uh, a friend of mine, she um, graduated and uh, I don't know, she was in her late 20s or some, maybe 30, and she was working for Goldman Sachs and she was uh, head of uh, VP of corporate finance, I think for the Far East. And she uh, went into China and uh, China, there's some places that are more open to the gospel, much of it are, is not. And it was kind of a get-to-know-you meeting with her, um, with her business and their Goldman's work over there. And so it was a get-to-know-you sort of opportunity. They said, hey, look, let's get to know uh, each other. These are the Chinese. Let's play a little bit of a game or do something. We want you to tell something to the rest of the group that's controversial, but that's very important to you. <laughs> well, she loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, she decided this was the opportunity. And there she was, explained in full, all of its fullness, went through something called the four spiritual laws that uh, Campus Crusade puts out of how every person in that room can know Jesus Christ. That takes guts working for a company like that, and in communist China, no less. That's a person stepping into significance. I think of people like uh, Ken Melrose. Those of you at Princeton know that name. Uh, the Melrose Center there. Ken went to Princeton. He became CEO of a Toro uh, Motor Company. They, um, or they do lawnmowers and, 
in law and sort of uh, work. And when he took over the company, he, he radically changed the way they go about things. For uh, one thing, instead of whenever there's a claim or people got injured from their lawnmowers or whatever else, instead of lawyering up and uh, going after it, they would fly to the people, sit down with them, and simply apologize for what happened. And uh, the lawyers told him, don't do this. But uh, he saw this is the way of Christ. This is a way of uh, being significant. It's a way of obeying the Lord. They saw their legal bills drop dramatically and the claims drop dramatically as they followed and did what the Lord wanted. You got another example connected to Princeton. How many of you know Professor Robbie George? Yeah, he's a remarkable Christian there. He's been outspoken for many years. I met him in 93 or something. I hadn't heard of him. He, uh, he got all the chaplains together, of which I was at the time. He says, hi, I'm Robbie George. We haven't met. And I just got tenure here at Princeton. If you ever have any trouble with anything, I'm on the um, U.S. Commission for Civil Rights. I can help you if there's an issue. And uh, he's been that way all through these years. He speaks openly for Jesus Christ. I asked him to come speak at a meeting one time, and I'd asked him to speak on the subject of, of rights of religious believers. He's in constitutional law. And uh, he shows up, and I was nervous because he showed up. The worship had already happened. I didn't know where he was. And he finally shows up, and he says, I've decided what I'm speaking on. And I was like, I thought I decided that three months ago. <laughs> and uh, he says, I'm speaking on the importance of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I said, come on in. And uh, he gave a mesmerizing, incredible lecture. You know, he's so outspoken for life issues that uh, he gets a lot of death threats. And one was so serious that the FBI raided um, a guy's home and discovered that he had a special kind of poison um, that's used to kill people because it can't be traced once um, it's ingested. And so they put him in prison. He's, he's serving right now two years of a four-year term. And, uh, and Robbie's like, you know, um, that's fine. It's fine. I, I just think that if he was going to do something like try to kill me, couldn't have been something a little bit more hazardous than poison? What is this, some sort of 18th century romance novel? Come on now. <laughs> Um, it's, it's amazing to see him um, as a professor and in that vocation to be open and loving Jesus Christ, uh, even with extraordinary consequences against him. It's really amazing. We have so many examples of such extraordinary people. So that's what significance is, following the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever he has you do. And now let's look at what significance accomplishes accomplishes, what it, I'm sorry, what it accomplishes is a reordering of our priorities in an extraordinary way. You guys were chanting a great slogan here at the beginning, and uh, I'm going to read the passage that this comes from in Acts 17. I'm going to read a few verses. This is Paul and Silas going around and sharing the gospel. They're in the city of Thessalonica, and they've had a lot of trials already, and here they come to this city. And uh, I'm going to read this passage, Acts 17, um, 1 through 9. It says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people of the city uh, and authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. What this passage tells us is that when we're living lives of significance, when we're following our Savior Jesus Christ, we can expect that things will be stirred up. We can expect that they can, there can be opposition. In Paul and Silas's case, it meant that they are flogged and beaten. There's a lot of examples of that. In Jason's house, he was just simply giving uh, hospitality. He received them into his house, and he is receiving all sorts of abuse because of what he was doing and being open to the Lord's ways. Uh, 
at this day and time, we can see the same thing happening around the world that we see that's happened in the scriptures. Because when the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, it does a number of things. One thing it does is it, it upends the social order. Here we had the problem as those who were the religious leaders, well, they were jealous because they're no longer going to be in charge of this gospel is true. And so they're fighting against us, against it. And whenever the gospel goes around the world today, it's usually those in religious um, authority position that fight it because they know what it means for them, uh, whether it be in Islam or Hinduism or wherever it is, or the local shaman leader, it's because it's going to up in their position, the whole social order. Um, if you go to a, a place like India that has the caste system too, and if you start preaching that everyone's equal, and suddenly the untouchables are now equal with the Brahmins, well, that's going to cause some problems and people aren't going to want to see it and hear it. It's not only it changes the social order, it changes the financial order as well. You see that in the scriptures. Uh, you see the example um, in just the chapter before when they're in Philippi. You may remember this story when there's this slave girl that keeps following Paul and Silas. He finally gets annoyed. Uh, what she had on her was a demon of divination. And so she had the ability through this a demon to uh, share the future, share other different things. And, uh, and uh, people who own this slave girl, they made money from it. And this is real. I've cast out demons of divination from people. They're alive and well today. They do do what the scriptures show here. Well, Paul got annoyed by her and cast it out. Well, the owners no longer can make money. Well, they got ticked off by that. And so it, it's, a riot ensued there. Same thing with the next chapter when they're in Ephesus. You got an, a similar economic upheaval because of the gospel. You have uh, Demetrius who was... The, uh, he made um, idols out of silver. And when they came to town and they said, um, Artemis is no longer the God who we should be worshipped, but only our Savior, Jesus Christ, well, that means he's going to be out of business. He should have thought, I'm going to make little crosses and put around people's necks. He could have made some real money. But he was just upset. He didn't know where this is going to go. And that's typical. When the gospel goes forth, it's not like you're intending it for to cause all of this, but it does. It happens. And we, as men and women of significance, are the agents of turning the world upside down. Here's a quote from a commentary I want to read. It says, accepting the lordship of Christ would mean new priorities and loyalties for those who became disciples. It would lead to the transformation of personal relationships, business and personal ethics, social structures and ambitions, new attitudes towards other religions, and change ways of relating to Caesar and his representatives. The Holy Spirit would progressively bring about these changes as Christians reflected together on the implications of their new life in Christ and received guidance from leaders such as Paul and Peter. The preaching of the gospel itself is disturbing to the social and political status quo wherever it is taken seriously. Amen. How true. That is always the case. And with it, we can expect uh, harassment, um, scorn, difficulty, problems of all different kinds. I think most of you are aware that at Harvard there's a problem. Uh, the uh, student ministry there is wanting to preserve um, the Christian view of sexuality, but uh, many there are opposed to that and are causing them all sorts of grief and pain. When the Harvard folks come here, pray for them, encourage them, and, uh, and the Christian Union ministry fellows as well. It's a hard situation that they're in. They're in. But it, it shouldn't surprise us. These things have always gone on. I think back, even myself, when I was in college, and I was in a fraternity at Cornell, and I was something called uh, the pledge educator, which means when new people come in, new pledges, I get them up to speed in the um, traditions of the fraternity and, and everything like that. Well, they wanted me to do something, and that is as part of the whole education process with these new pledges. Part of it was I was supposed to teach him a couple of dirty songs about some of the sororities on campus. You can imagine what the songs were like, and uh, it's not something that I felt as a Christian I should be doing. And uh, what was so weird about it is any brother in the fraternity could at dinner or any other time even walk in and teach these and two silly um, yet degrading songs anytime they wanted to. But people were outraged that I wouldn't do it. And I'd never seen this happen before or after, but they actually held a special impeachment kind of vote uh, for me to see whether they're going to boot me out of there. And um, they didn't. They, they stayed with me, and I stayed in my role, um, praise God. But how odd that it would be so important that these um, silly, perverse songs would be taught, that it would be brought up, that I would be removed from office. 
And sadly, uh, not too long after, people were running for the office for next year. And as you would expect, when people were standing up and they're you know, wanting to be pledge educator, they, uh, the brothers would, other brothers would ask and say, well, if the brothers wanted you to do something and you felt it was immoral, you know, would you still do it anyway? And uh, I had a friend who was running to be pledge educator who's a Christian. And, uh, you know, poor Roger, he's up there. He's like, well, of course not. I can't do that. And uh, the guy who said, I would do what the brothers want me to do is the guy who um, won and how sad that is. But that's the world that we live in. It's always been that way. It was that way when I was in college. It's way that now. It's, it's back in the first century. But we have the honor to serve the Lord Jesus Christ no matter what happens, up or down, left or right. It's a privilege to walk with him no matter what comes to us. And the good news is, in heaven, we'll get so many rewards for what we've done. We'll get so many rewards. A lot of people aren't aware that there are uh, rewards in heaven, but there are rewards, and they'll be extraordinary. The last thing I want to mention um, about living life of significance is how do we attain it? There's a lot that can be said about this, more than I can um, get into, but I want to share a few things. The first thing I want to share about it is significance can be attained, and it's worth going after to seek God to live a life like this a life of sacrifice, of devotion and love for Jesus Christ is worth it. It is worth pursuing. There are many scriptures that uh, talk about the importance of going after noble things. I think even Timothy 3.1 says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. There are many noble things to go after and to live a life of significance will bring those about. I wanna read a passage in Hebrews 11.32 through 38, uh, which speaks to this issue. This is in the famous chapter of Hebrews 11, where you get this whole slew of amazing, extraordinary stories of people who've gone before, um, men and women of extraordinary faith and devotion to Christ. Let me um, read this. It's really moving. It's really extraordinary. And I'll, I'll pull out a couple of things from here. It says 1132 to 38, Hebrews. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might um, rise and receive a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. That last phrase there always moves me. I get goosebumps. Of whom the world was not worthy. What an example we have here. And I want to point to something uh, in particular here, and starting with this phrase when it says, they were made strong out of weakness. Made strong out of weakness. This is one of the ways we come into the significance of our lives. We get made strong in our weakness. And by weakness, I want to give you the scriptural definition of it is, when you're translating words from another language, sometimes it's not always just exact. And sometimes when we hear weakness in our modern um, times, we think of, of timidity, we may think of weakness of, um, as uh, maybe inability or fear or shrinking back or maybe a avoidance of conflict. Uh, and that's not what weakness means here um, and the other places in the scriptures. What weakness means, and we'll look at some passages here, is when you're receiving persecution, when you're receiving harassment, when you're getting uh, false accusations, maybe even physical torture, um, that you continue to follow the Lord in any case. So weakness here means you're feeling the weakness of who you are because you're getting all this abuse coming at you. That's what it means here. And so when we're weak, uh, it doesn't mean being fearful. It doesn't mean being timid. It doesn't mean uh, shrinking back from what the Lord calls us to do. And uh, misunderstanding that can really set us back. 
Um, strength comes as a result of weakness. Um, it says here in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, it says, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And the weakness, again, I'll read. It's when I, I am content with insults, hardships, and persecutions. Just a few verses before, the Apostle Paul talks more about the weakness that he endured. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Wow. Wow, that was the weakness that Paul experienced. But it's because of that weakness he continued to seek and follow the Lord, he became strong. And you see another phrase right there in the same, in verse 34 as well, that, that echoes and reinforces this first phrase. This first phrase is that um, it was made strong out of weakness. The second phrase is, became mighty in war. Became mighty in war. When we are in war for the Lord's sake, and you saw examples here, people who are testifying to the Lord, people who are receiving um, persecution, people are proclaiming God's ways. Uh, we become uh, strong, we become mighty. Uh, we see that with Daniel. Remember Daniel, when the decree was issued that he can't uh, take time to uh, pray and worship his God, but he did it anyway, so they threw him the lion's den. He became mighty in war. We see it with Queen Esther. When she approached the king, she was afraid she could be put to death for approaching the king without being called. Yet she did it to save her people, and many were saved. Uh, we see it right in the passage we read in Acts 17 about Jason. Um, he endured all sorts of hardship. He has become mighty in battle. We see so many examples through the scriptures and in our current time of all of these who've done this. And so we have this choice uh, today. We have the opportunity. Will we follow him? Will we love him and seek that significance no matter what? It, there's nothing wrong with asking to get rid of the hardships. The Apostle Paul asked three times if the Lord would take away all these things. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. And he wouldn't take it away so that he would depend on him all the more. And so we can ask him, Lord, take it away. And if he does, praise his name. If he doesn't, then we can know he's using this so that we can become stronger in him. Y'all remember the story of David. David was able to take care of the lion and the bear when he was younger. So then when the time of Goliath came, he was able to face him. And the things you are facing right now in your own lives, family things, things on campus, um, harassment, difficulty, problems, what they are is they're training you. Um, the Lord is, is building you up. He is making you mighty in war so that 10 years from now, when the bigger challenge come, you stand as strong as a lion. 10 years after that, something else. 10 years after that, something else. By the end of his life, Daniel was just extraordinary and just a lion of a man. Same thing with Paul and so many others. That's who we want to be by the grace of God. But we must endure. We must believe. We must know that the Lord has a purpose in all of this. This is what um, a life of significance is. It's a life of following Jesus Christ, of following the Lord, of obeying him, of being in fellowship with him no matter what it is. It's a true view of what significance is, not all these other things that can come uh, before us. Um, what I want to do now is send you guys off to spend some time with the Lord, to talk to him and to hear him. And uh, this will might be a challenge because a lot of times we don't sit silently before the Lord. And we need to hear from him. He'll speak to you. He'll speak to your mind and speak to your conscience. I promise you. He does these things. And so what I love you for to, to do for this is, if you don't mind, to turn off your phones. Just power them down. I promise you, whatever's there will be there when you turn it back on later. It'll be just fine. You know, our phone and communication these days 
are really amazing in what they can do. They can put us in touch. We can hear and learn and do some extraordinary things. But they also can um, hinder our walks with the Lord if we don't get away from them from time to time. We need time to hear from the living God, and, he, and he's not coming through the phone. So we got to hear by the Spirit into our consciences. So I ask you to turn them off, power down. It'll be totally fine. And I'd also ask you during this time, and you'll have 30 minutes, which might seem forever if you've never taken time to listen to the Lord like this, um, but the Lord will be speaking to you. But as we begin this time, to, to not say anything to the people next to you. Just not say a word. Uh, you'll want to stay here, some of them, but some of you may want to go out in the hallway or somewhere else and that sort of thing, and just take time to listen. And I'm going to give you a couple of questions that you can ask the Lord and really listen to Him. In my own life, some of the most powerful and important times have come at times like this, at a conference, where I've had some alone time with the Lord. I remember many uh, through my life, very significant um, so I'm praying that it's just as significant for you as you take time. And then after this, you'll go right to your groups. So the groups, the, the, um, I think you know where they are. They're kind of listed here, um, where they are. Just go right there. Be there um, by 940, 945. So you got a lot of time here, a time to listen to the Lord and the time to get to those groups. So it's going to be hard um, to do that. Um, it's also helpful to read your Bible, but... So many of you have your Bible on your phone. I think it might be too much of a temptation. If you feel like it's going to be a temptation and things are going to start buzzing and clicking, I encourage you just to keep it off. And, uh, or if you have a paper Bible, you can use that. But it's okay to take the time just to listen to the Lord. And here are some questions I'd like you to ask him. The first one is, Lord, am, help me. Am I willing to be a nobody for you? Are you willing to be a nobody for God? to never be known, to never be famous, to never be recognized in any way, shape, or form. I remember some times in my life where I've wrestled with that. It's powerful. When you're willing to be a nobody for the Lord, it puts you in a position to really hear where he takes you on your path because the temptations to have this worldly view of significance is so strong. So that's your question. Lord, um, am I willing to be a nobody for you? Secondly, Am I willing to be made mighty in battle? Am I willing when the Lord brings it? Not that we're inviting hardship and problems. We don't do that. There's no example of that. But when it does come, will I not shrink back, but will I follow the Lord and love him? Am I willing um, to be made mighty in battle? And thirdly, um, asking the Lord and asking yourself, what stands in the way of having the will of God be the highest and most important goal in your life? What stands in the way? Ask him. He'll tell you. He'll tell you. Maybe it's something you're doing that has to stop. Maybe it's some situation in your end. Maybe it's perspective, something else. He'll tell you. So again, am I willing to be a nobody for God? Two, am I willing to be made mighty in battle? And third, what stands in the way of having the will of God be the most important thing in my life? So I'm going to pray, and then you can stay right where you are. You can pull to a side or do whatever else. Let's just... Be quiet as we do it, though, so we don't disturb anybody else as they're seeking the Lord. And then get in your groups and share what the Lord has told you in your groups. It'll be profound. You'll be blessed as other people share. So let me, let me say a prayer. Holy Spirit, come. Lord Jesus, come. We ask, have mercy on us. We declare the kingdom of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is present in all its fullness and all its power. Father, bring your spirit down right now into the hearts and minds of every man and woman in this room. By your grace, speak to us. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us to hear from you. Speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Reveal your ways to us. Reveal your grace and your mercy. Um, Lord, we need you. Have mercy on us. By your grace, Lord, let this be a turning point in our lives. Let this be a turning point in every person's lives here so that we can know and walk and love you more fully. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.